Hello and welcome back. Sean here, Mountains Garage, evening edition. If you watched the first part of this Turbo 400 street build, mild street build, you knew that I worked on it this morning and this afternoon, early re release from school. So I hung out with my son all afternoon, had dinner, played a few rounds of cards. I lost. And then here I am out in the shop working on, well, clearing the bench off, working on sub assemblies. Uh, so already I've stuck the governor in. This is not the governor out of the transmission, but I thought I should note that most everybody knows when you go like this, you can see the valve inside the hole, the governor valve. It should move like this, but more importantly, it should drop a second time when you squeeze the inner weights right here. So it should drop once, should drop a second time. That's when you know your governor is good. I wash the outside and if everything's free, and in this case, this transmission was fully functioning, fluid was nice and clean, not a thing wrong with it. So you do not need to disassemble it, but if you need to, I actually made a piece of tubing with a little screw that goes down in between where it rides in the case to hold the governor still. You put it towards you, knock out the roll pin, take off the plastic gear, which sometimes fails. And if I didn't have 400 uh, stock ones, I, I actually stock some brand new ones too. So. so it's not unusual for a governor gear to fail, but if your transmission stops shifting, two things, check the vacuum at the modulator externally, and then pull your governor cover off and uh, see if your gear is broken. So. so I just washed up my governor, lubed where it goes into the case with ATF, not enough that it's drooling down, gonna get all of my gasket, and then I bolted the cover on with four bolts. No big deal. I'm gonna wipe my hands off so I don't get my nice clean parts dirty. That's important. Uh, next, I'm gonna put in the rear servo. I already serviced it. It's gonna have a fully functioning accumulator. I put a new O-ring on it already. Reverse in this transmission worked perfect. Again, all factory not wore out so I don't really need to check the pin length or anything like that which I've showed you my method for doing that and someday I'm going to use my new tool to actually check it and when I do I'll discuss that more but most of the factory pins I find are all the same so I've been watching since I saw the chart and knew that these little lines meant something different which I knew that anyway but I always take the rear servo cover that goes here and I put it on my belt sander, and this one cleaned right up nicely. Right away, sometimes they're really warped. New gasket, and we're gonna stick that together. I changed the seals in the speedometer. Driven gear in here is a small spring. You always, when you're picking it out with your small pocket screwdriver, keep your finger over the end, because when that thing clears the end of the hole, it's going into orbit. <laughs> and Going back in, same way, I tuck the seal with a pocket screwdriver. This one's round on the end, but somewhere there's a flat one right here, which works a lot better for pushing down the seal all the way. Put the spring in, I dip the driven gear into here, put some lube on it, and when it goes in, it should pop into the seal and actually hold itself. If this housing wants to fall off the gear, it's probably going to leak. So I'll lube the outside O-ring, stick that in, no problem, and the tail housing is all ready to go. I already installed my seal. Now, unusual, this is a two-wheel drive 68 Impala, and the O-ring is on the shaft. So this slip yoke for the drive shaft in this two-wheel drive car obviously goes up over the O-ring to seal, and there's a weep hole in the very end of it. I seriously doubt it has a two-piece drive shaft, but I've seen that many times where the yoke actually slides over the O-ring. So typically I never get to use this O-ring. I have many, many in a bag if I haven't thrown them all away. So I put a brand new one on there. Felt kind of strange. This transmission is out of my comfort zone because I have to put way too many parts back in. In a race, Turbo 400, you throw a lot of this stuff away. I said that earlier. So I'm going to bolt this stuff on. 
and then move on to the next item. This is about my fourth take. Let's try it again. Moving along, I installed the intermediate clutches, three and three, they're Alto Smooth Greens. And it had a wave plate in the bottom on the intermediate clutches. So I get rid of that and just a flat plate. I also got rid of the weak stock intermediate snap ring and put an HD snap ring in there. And then I set my uh, second gear manual break-in band, which makes the direct drum harder to install. Once again, I'm spoiled by building race transmission. All these stock transmissions have all these extra parts. It's ridiculous. So the direct drum, I've washed it all up somewhat. If you can see these three seals, this is the one we're leaving off. This is step two of the direct drum or direct clutch dual feeding. We left the second seal back on the center support off. Now we're leaving the center seal out of the direct drum. These are the old ones. I'll put new ones in because these are hot as a rock. And on the back it had this beautiful gold 16 element sprag. I've never actually counted them. It just says they're 16, so I believe them. If you think it'd be half of 34, but that's not. So the easiest way to install this, and you have a 50-50 shot of getting it right, is I like to put it in the race and put the first shield down. Just gonna fall out anyway. And if you rotate it clockwise, which is the way it has to freewheel anyway, it falls right on. It locks to the left, three wheels to the right. So think of watching the clock, the second hand, it just goes round and round. And I'll put all that stuff back on. The forward clutch, I'm gonna go ahead and do that as well. I'm also gonna leave the center seal off. Not necessarily dual feeding it, it just gives you the whole piston. Chevrolet did, or GM did that on the 4L, 4L. <laughs> TH-475s. So if you, one of the most asked questions, one of the many, is what clutch to use. And some people boil it down to a shifting clutch, which is everything but the forward. The forward clutches just come on when you put it in gear and they stay on all the time. And most people will tell you that a waffle type clutch should go in a shifting clutch. It might be preferred. And in the forward, you can run smooth. Oddly enough, from the factory, these are my forward clutches, and they are somewhat of a waffle. They have a line cut in them. And the directs are smooth with the date still on them. Like I said, I could, could have put the stock clutches back in, but probably this isn't the right application for that. So, And me being a pack rat, I'll save them for something. Probably never use them. They are kind of cool with the date on them. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and build the direct and the forward and catch you back here afterwards. And we're back another day. It's morning, Thursday morning, ready to assemble my direct drum and eventually the forward. I'm only going to show you one because they take the same tools, same procedure. You install the lip seals with the lip facing the oil. They would feel completely strange the other way. I assume I've never tried it. So make sure both the inner and outer tools are pressed down in place. Of course, I've made them slippery. Uh, before I push it in, I just want to mention that because this had five and five clutches, it's getting five and five clutches, so there's no machine work, there's nothing. I'm going to put the Raybestos waffles in the direct and the Borgwana, I guess the tans. And in stock form, the forward clutch gets the thinner of the five steels. If you buy a rebuild kit, it's going to give you 10 steels to fit the forward and direct. The thick ones go in the direct, the thin ones go in the forward. So I've installed and ran my finger around, make sure everything pushed in. We'll leave the center seal off on both drums. And it doesn't matter which hand you use. There's nothing really trick about it other than the tool. It does a great job and it's slippery sometimes. You just kind of want to spin it in and you're done. That one likes to stick. 
and I know it's correct when I can spin the piston and it's not bound up. So, I believe you can still see it. There's a piece of string hanging out of the case. I just have it looped around the manual second gear braking band that I have to put back in. It grabs the side of the direct drum right here. When I go to put this down in the case, it's hot enough to do anyway. I'm going to use the forward clutch. I'm gonna put all the clutches in, use the pressure plate that belongs in the forward clutch just for a handle, and I will spin it down in. I'm looking, what do I do with that? Right here. So this belongs in the forward clutch, but I'm gonna put it in the direct because it fits right in and use this as a handle because it's extra difficult getting it past the band and you're going to want this piece of string so you can kind of pick up in the band. The band's gonna, excuse me, the drum's gonna wanna drag the band down and with the string in place, because there's no room for anything else in there, it'd be nice if you could get you know, a hook down in there, but you can't. So I use a piece of string, kind of hold up on it, wiggle it into the clutches, and then just whip the string out. No big deal. Okay, I lowered both drums into the case. The piece of string worked like a charm. Uh, without a case saver in the case, you can physically see the direct drum couldn't go down anymore. Physically, it's gonna hit the center support. And of course it clunks when you pick up and down on it. And the same with the forward. You can put your hand right next to it and it's flush with the direct drum. It couldn't go any further. The pump gasket's in place. When it's correct, you can read three speed at 12 o'clock. You know, cut into the gasket. I have put a new Durabond bushing in my pump, lubed up the seal after I installed it and the bushing. I put a little bit of petroleum jelly, in this case, on the gears just so they're not dry. If I put liquid in them, it's going to leak out when I'm assembling the pump, but it's not a bad idea if you don't mind that. I have a converter hub that I put in after I assemble the pump to make sure it spins and make sure the, the bushing is correct. Make sure nothing bad happened, but it looks perfect, so I don't expect anything. And I also use, before I assemble the pump, I'm gonna go ahead and set this in the case and just pull up and down on my input shaft to make sure the front end play feels in the ball pack. For the pressure regulator spring, it had this, what we call the stock blue one, white or blue, I guess it's the lightest one. You can tell by the free length and just squishing it, but better than that, much more scientific on the Facebook DIY Terra 400 page, Aaron Ginn, a real good contributor on this, smart guy, has a tranny shop. He did a nice test using a bolt, uh, with its length simulating the installed length of the spring and he pushed down on a bathroom scale and he tested all the popular springs and it shows you that you know this one's gonna make more pressure than this one you should watch the video if you go to the diy Terra 400 page on facebook type in aaron ginn pressure regulator spring it'll take you right to the little video i love when people do stuff like that that's really helpful because i had forgotten exactly uh, what spring did what, because I'm typically replacing these with one that came with my transbrake valve body, so when I go backwards, I have the 200 PSI spring from Cone that I buy uh, sometimes when I'm doing this, but that's a little too aggressive for what I'm doing today. So I wanted a little bit more than stock. The trucks usually come with a yellow or orange. Somewhere around here, I have a bag of orange ones, but I believe they read the same. So that is what it's going to get. Well, we're getting there. The pump's in. I got it laid on her back. Time to start talking about the control system and any modifications we're gonna do. I've already put the governor in completely stock. I'm not gonna touch it. Turbo 400 is fortunate. It's a pretty firm shifting transmission with the exception of maybe Cadillacs they really tried to soften them up but in this case we've increased the 
pressure regulate a spring, which is going to just that one modification, probably show shift improvements. So what else do we do? Well, I've done a whole video on an automatic shifting valve body and a manual shifting valve body. And the automatic shifting valve body that I did a video on was slightly wilder than this one, if you will, but still automatic shifting. So what does that mean? Well, let's start talking about check balls first and the separator plate. I'm gonna modify it and I've actually marked it on here. Basically, this is your shift kit. You're gonna drill maybe only one, possibly two holes and plug one if you like. Let's start with the dual feed. We already left the center seal out of the direct drum. We left the second ring back off the center support. And now you either need to weld up this hole, it says dual feed right there, you probably can't see it, but. Or I just put a 555-115 Dorman 3 8 cup plug and drove it in the hole from this perspective to the right of the center support bolt and I drove it all the way down in the hole. So that's blocking one side of the feed. So as far as the one, two shift and the two, three shift, these are the feed holes. And we're gonna do one of two things. The other video I did, I left the check ball out and that negates the need on the one, two shift to actually drill the feed hole because look at the size of the check ball hole. So when the check ball slams shut, the oil has to go through the feed hole. If you don't put a check ball in it, there's a giant hole there already. Probably too big. It's pretty hard on pots. So I choose on this mild street transmission to install <clears throat> the three check balls right down the middle. You need the front one in the middle and the back one in the bathtub anyway. And I go ahead and put the second gear check ball in too and then I'm gonna drill the hole to eighth inch. Third gear, I'll probably go 964, so I what I normally do. And when you do that, you don't necessarily have to drill and tap the pressure, reg uh, the accumulator for the two, three shift, however, you can, so that's an option. Also on the valve body, you'll see the hole right there. When you see it open, that means it's never been modified. We need to take out this valve. We're gonna grind a flat. And again, this information is out there everywhere. That's gonna get rid of the automatic override. Right now in stock form, all Turbo 400s, when you get to a certain RPM in low gear, even if you're in manual low, it's gonna shift a second. They thought it was necessary. It's probably the only transmission on the planet maybe that does that. Who knows? We're gonna disable that so you can hold it in low gear till you blow the connecting rods out of it. To do that, you grind one flat on the valve and you have to plug that hole. You can enlarge it slightly and drive a check ball in there. I prefer to tap it and put a tiny Allen screw in there just in the cast iron, I don't want to drop down into the bore. So it takes a little finesse, but no big deal. And I'm probably not going to plug the accumulator, so that's good to go. My spring is not broken. My pots match, match up, in this case, early smooth with the ridge over here on the apply piston. So also has an early kick down solenoid that requires a gasket. If you see a black gasket made into the, the uh, kick down switch, then you don't need this gasket. I see that mistake a lot. Just because it's in the kit and the holes line up, you don't have to use it in the majority of the time because they only use these early switches in the first few years. So, And finally, the vacuum modulator, <clears throat> which is also a good indicator of whether you should run the steel rings, ceiling rings on the center support and the rear of the pump like I did in this one, I left the steel rings in it. If you're still running the modulator, that's probably the threshold. When you get rid of your modulator and you have fixed line pressure or fixed modulator pressure, <clears throat> you should probably go to Teflon rings. That seems to be the standard. Oh, sorry, I just 
to poke my finger. So I'm changing over to this adjustable modulator and I go ahead and turn in the screw down the center of it in the middle. I go two turns in because I want to raise the shift points enough. I do that. I've never installed one of these where I didn't crank it in a couple turns and seldom if ever back it up. But you can adjust your light throttle shifting with the center screw. And this gives you a nice adapter hose to hook onto your stock line if it's still existent because this is what your stock modulator valve looked like. And you can see where the hose makes the corner for you. And this was technically adjustable. There's a screw in the back. That still works, but I've never installed one. I've taken a lot out, but I've never actually put one back. So finally, before I say goodbye, the valve body gaskets, every kit now provides you with a universal valve body gasket, lower gasket, if you will. The upper gasket is dependent on whether you have an 88 and up style case with the extra check ball. I have an early one, so you want the one with the yellow stripe. And the instructions are good. They give you a warning. So you're going to throw this one away. You can only save so many, but this is the one that goes against the case. And you want the one with the yellow stripe. Unless you have the extra check ball. So I guess we've covered about everything. I'm going to put the rest of this together. This is what? Well, on my, my third day of assembly, shooting the video definitely slowed me down, but worthwhile, I guess, and uh, they, don't, they weren't full days, and that's just the way it is. It wouldn't take nearly as long if I wasn't cleaning parts. If I could just assemble, I needed to clone myself, have, you know, Sean too washing parts all the time. He wouldn't even complain. <laughs> anyway, hope you got something out of it, and uh, we'll be back soon enough.